All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Connections. Praise God for another day and another opportunity for you and I to gather together around the good Word of God. We are blessed with faithful Abraham. Amen. All right. Having your Bibles this morning, let's open them, please, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 42. Isaiah 42 and verse number 22. I do not have a sermon this morning. I have a message from the Lord. (laughs) And I'm so thankful that I have a message from the Lord. Especially here today, (laughs) I want a message from the Lord. I want to hear from heaven, glory to God. And normally, here's what preachers would do when they get in a situation like this. You You want to teach something you've taught like 10 times before? Because you want to do a good job and you don't want to flub up, you know. And I, that was my intention. <laughs> but praise God, the Lord had other intentions. And I, I believe with all of my heart, as you listen to the word today, that you're going to sense not only it being a message for us, but I believe you're going to sense the spirit of prophecy on it, that there is a, a prophetic flavoring concerning this whole message. And there's things I, I can't say because I'm being recorded, but you and I will later on, we'll go, he, he, we'll know. <laughs> and we'll talk after, after this service. So Isaiah 42 and verse 22. I want to talk to you today about the God who restores. The God who restores. Our God is a God of restoration. Isaiah 42 verse 22, the Bible says, but this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes and they are hidden prison houses. They are for a prey and none of them delivereth for a spoil and none saith restore. One more time. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes, and they are hidden prison houses. They are for a prey, and none delivereth for a spoil, and none saith restore. And none saith restore. Our God is a God who restores. God doesn't throw away... God doesn't recycle, He restores. You and I will look at stuff and we'll think, well, that's it, that's no good, let's just get rid of it. And God says, oh, no, no, that's the beginning of a masterpiece. When I'm through with that and restore it to what I have intended for it, that's going to be a masterpiece. And since I'm the master, that's all I do is create masterpieces. You understand? (laughs) We want to throw away, the best we can do is recycle, but God says, I'm going to restore. It's good to know that we have a God who restores. Hallelujah. None saith restore. This verse brought conviction to me when I saw it. Because it applies to me. For years, I didn't say restore. And I was wrong and I had to repent. Because our God, our Father, His his heart, His nature is, I'm going to restore that. We're done. We think it's over with. We think it's through. Just accept defeat and throw up the, the white flag. And God says, oh, no, 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 dear. No, no. We're going to restore. We're going to restore. People go through things and forget that whatever may happen in the negative can be restored. As a Christian, you need to be reminded that it is not over. And man, have you ever heard the devil's song on that one? It's over. That's like his top ten favorite hits. It's over. It's over. Have you ever heard that tune? I have. It's over. It's over. It's over. It's over. Boo-hoo. It's over. Hmm. You need to be reminded it's not over. 
whatever condition, whatever position you find yourself in, I want you to know that it's not over. Because our God is a God who loves to restore. Hallelujah. Everything, and I want you to hear this word, everything that Satan took from you can be restored. Everything he's taken from you can be restored. You know he's a thief, right? Jesus said in John 10.10 10, that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Does that, does that mean, okay, he stole and now it's over? Let's, no, no. Our God restores. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, amen. Preach it, baby. Preach it. For those of you listening, this baby is my wife. <laughs> Everything that Satan took from you, it can be restored, which means... You don't have to mope around and be sad and defeated. I didn't expect any amens and I got one. Because we all went, ouch. We all went, oh me. I've been guilty of moping around, feeling sad, feeling defeated. Why? Because no one says restore. You and I have no business... Singing the blues when our God is a God who restores. I I don't like depression. Because in depression, you get to the lowest part you can, and then you ask for a shovel so you can go lower. Because it's just not low enough. And God's trying to get us to come up higher to His way of thinking, which is, I'm a God who will restore that. You don't need a lot of friends who will sing the blues with you. You need friends that will say, restore. Hallelujah. Do you realize that condemnation and fear are back doors the devil uses to gain entry into your life? Condemnation and fear are back doors the devil uses to gain entry into your life. He wants to bring, and I want you to catch this word because we're... The emphasis is restore, but the opposite of restore is the word shame. The devil wants to bring shame. He loves to bring shame. Shame is a weight that stops you from moving forward into your future. Man, I am preaching myself under the table today. That's just not fair, Lord. (laughs) I'm the minister. (laughs) Shame is a weight that will stop you from moving it forward into your future. Shame is designed to stop you from finishing. Shame is a tool, it's a weapon of the enemy. It's designed to stop you from finishing. And God wants you to finish. God's not a quitter. Right? God needs you to finish. He needs you to finish. Oh, no, he's God. He doesn't need anything. You need to read your Bible again. There's things he needs. He needs you to finish what you've started. I don't care how long it takes. I don't care how many rigmaroles. I don't care all the junk you've got to throw, go through and all the stuff that hits the fan. You've got to finish what God's called you to do. And the devil says, we can't have you finishing, so I want to heap a whole lot of guilt and shame and condemnation on you So you'll be so weighted down, you won't step into the future that God has for you. Nobody remembers how you start, but everybody remembers how you finish. Right? Are you going to finish what God's called you to do? Amen. Amen. It's the wrong time to quit. It's a word for somebody. It's the wrong time to quit. You're about to bump into everything you've ever dreamed of. That's why the heat's been turned up. That's why there's pressure on every side. No matter what movie you watch, no matter what, how many brownies you eat, you can't find relief. The pressure's on because the devil wants you to quit because you're about to jump right into all that God has for you. And so he's going to remind you of all your past and all of your sins and all of your mistakes. Glory, God, I'm having a good time. But we don't need to be full of shame. Our God restores. I'm beginning to get a revelation. 
that the greatest faith isn't for finances. The greatest faith isn't for the healing of your body. The greatest faith is for relationships. And God says, oh, that's my specialty. (laughs) Because he's a God who restores. Amen. Amen. Once again, it's important to God that you finish your assignment, that you complete what he's called you to do. And God will keep you some kind of busy. He will. He will keep you busy. I went to bed, slept for a half hour, woke up, too excited about today. Went, sat in the living room for a while, and I thought, okay, what am I going to do now? <laughs> Just sitting here, what am I going to do? Five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, what am I going to do? I can't go to sleep because I'm all wired. What am I going to do? I, went, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go take communion. Oh, I'm so glad I did. About 15 minutes with the Lord. And it's like, oh, yeah, it's time to go to bed now. When you've done all you can do, then you give it to the master and let him do what you can't do. Because he loves to restore. Praise God. You don't have to be ashamed because of restoration. We need to get used to saying the word restore. Say that with me. Restore. Again, restore. When stuff hits you, when life hits you something that you did not expect, the, one of the first words that needs to come out of our mouth is restore. Restore. God, I hadn't planned on that. That's so inconvenient. God, I, I thought I was just about to step into what you had for me. Now I've got all this mess to deal with. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Hit it with the word restore. Right? What is available to you? Restoration. Because God is the one who restores. Praise the Lord. Go with me please to Joel chapter 2. Joel 2 and 21. For those of you that are listening to this, I have a people well trained. that They can say amen, take notes, and turn in their Bible all at the same time. They are, they are a multi, multi-talented, multi-anointed group of people. Joel chapter 2. Joel 2, verse 21 through 27. Joel chapter 2. For you newbies, page 1146. Joel. Little bitty book toward the back of the Old Testament there. He's got a friend called Amos. Joel 2, 21. I want to give time for people to turn there so you guys can see these verses. They're important. So it's Hosea, Joel, Amos. Are you there? All right, good deal. Joel 2, 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Everybody say this, say, my God God will do do great things in my life. My God God will do do great things in my life. life. One more time for good measure. My God God will do do great things things in my life. life. Isn't that what he said? Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. The canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you 
and my people shall never be ashamed. <laughs> Opposite of shame. And ye will not be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. I hear sometimes the word overflow. And people talk about getting in the overflow. But it's interesting, you will never experience overflow until you first get in the flow. <laughs> you got to get in the flow before you experience overflow. Amen. And there are people that are standing on the dry part of land and they talk about overflow, but they don't want to even get their foot over in the flow. <laughs> You're going to have to get in the flow to get in the overflow. Now, the overflow is manifested, and it's the result of a strong anointing. Amen. You'll never experience overflow without a strong anointing, Amen. which means you're not going to experience a flow without an anointing. So you got to get in the anointing and be anointed and learn to yield to the anointing before you get in the overflow, Amen. right? Hope that makes sense. How many of you have some years, don't raise your hand, how many of you have some years that need to be restored? You thought maybe God forgot about you and He forgot about all those years? He hasn't. He hasn't. God doesn't forget anything we go through. He takes good records, brothers and sisters. He takes good records. From the biggest thing to the smallest, he takes good records and he desires to restore to you all that you've been through. Thank you, Lord. Before it's over with, he will restore to you the years. God's desire is for his people to never be ashamed. The devil will do his best to shame you. And most shame comes from church people. <laughs> And they give you shame because of what you couldn't get right. You struggled and you struggled and you struggled to get it right. And then you got the self-righteous with, you know, pointing their finger and judging you. And the devil, unfortunately, uses church people to bring shame. But when God's finished restoring you, there will be no shame. You will not be ashamed. Amen. Hallelujah. Like one man said, get ready, get ready, get ready. <laughs> Get ready, the shame is about to be removed. The shame is about to be removed. God's people live with way too much shame. That secret little sin, the thing that's been known and the whole city knows about it. There's two mills in Pueblo. There's the steel mill and there's the rumor mill. <laughs> Have you ever been part of the rumor mill? They manufacture a lot. They manufacture a lot. That's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week mill that's working, okay? And they may have said some things about you and caused some shame, but what they don't understand is you serve a God who restores. And when He's done restoring you, you're going to be smiling, and they're going to be apologizing. Hallelujah. Isaiah 61, please. Isaiah 61 and 7. I don't care how many years that need to be restored, God will restore the years to you. I think that is so powerful because we don't just go through something for 30 minutes. <laughs> Usually we go through stuff for years, right? I don't like that, and I'm sure you don't like that either. I don't like going through stuff that takes years to get through. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Yep. I'm restoring. I'm restoring, daughter. I'm restoring. Hallelujah. Praise God. So do a happy dance. Uh, not right now. I'm, I'm preaching. Do it afterwards, all right? <laughs> Isaiah 61, 7. For your shame ye shall have double, 
and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For shame, for your shame and all that you went through, God's going to give you a double portion. When you get the double, question, when you get the double, where's the shame? <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. Right? We blew that pop popsicle stand. It's gone, man. When you receive the double, not only is that restoration, but there's no more shame. This tells us one of the ways that God brings restoration. This tells us one of the, of the ways that God causes His people not to be ashamed is that He gives us a double portion for all that we've been through. Praise the Lord is right. Thank you, Jesus. You're listening close, right? God is saying, I'm going to restore some things to you because of what somebody else did to you. I'm going to restore some things to you because of what somebody else said about you. Those are two different things. God is so in love with you and He's so concerned and so compassionate toward you. He's going to take care of what they did to you and He's going to take care of what they said about you. Your reputation is important to the Father. Your reputation is important to Him. Sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, people's words, man, I'm telling you, they can say something that's just as bad as if they had done something to you. Life and death and the power of the tongue. And just what they said about you, God's like, oh, okay, I'm going to write that down. They're going to get double for that comment. Oh, I overheard that gossip. I'm writing it. That. They're getting double for that gossip. Oh, they didn't get that promotion because so-and-so said what? Yeah, they're going to get double for that too. Nobody says restore. And this is why we haven't experienced restoration like we should. We're not saying it. We're not talking about it. God's will is to restore you. God has not forgotten what has been stolen, what has been taken, what has been lost. What has been damaged, he has not forgotten. And he will restore. I believe I have a message from the Lord this morning. For God to forget what we go through would be for our Father to be in debt. And he's in debt to no man. Once again, he takes good records. God will not be in debt. But you know, it, it just goes so beyond that. It's just the fact that He wants His people restored. And He cares about our reputation. He cares about our life. He wants us to have a good life. Amen. You can talk blab it, grab it all you want. You can talk and make fun of me that I'm a prosperity preacher. But I'm telling you, my God is a good Father. Amen. And He wants us to have a good life. It's the devil who wants us to have a bad life. Right? Come on, somebody say restore. 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 Read with me please in Nehemiah. Nehemiah 5. Nehemiah. Thank you, Lord, for Nehemiah. Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. Nehemiah 5, verses 11 and 12. Somebody say restore. restore. Anybody need some restoration? Amen. Hmm. Nehemiah 5, 11 and 12. Restore, I pray you, to them even this day their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, and their houses also the hundredth part of the money of the corn, 
the wine and the oil that ye exact of them. Then said they, We will restore them, and will require nothing of them, so will we do as thou sayest. Then I called the priest and took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise. Nehemiah said restore. I don't know if you've ever read closely the book of Nehemiah. It's a great book. It's an exciting book. God had called Nehemiah to rebuild the walls, rebuild things that had been torn down, fallen down, been destroyed. And Nehemiah had a passion for restoration. He had the word restore in his mouth a lot. And yet, I just want to bring this point home one more time. There are Christians who won't say this word. They think it's over with. They think it's, it's gone, it's hopeless, but it's not with God. When was the last time you heard a Christian say the word restore? When was the last time you heard a Christian talk about for five minutes in a, in a casual conversation about how our God loves to restore? Hardly ever. Hardly ever. We got to get back to this. We got to get back to this. We got to start talking about how our God is a God of restoration, right? And if you notice, if you read through Nehemiah, not only did he say restore, there was restoration. <laughs> you know, it got all got restored, but it's because God had a man, he found a man who kept saying restore, restore. This is going to be one of my favorite words for a while. All right, how about you? You want to tag along? When we see things in our life going in the wrong direction, one of the first things we could say to it and should say to it is restore. Just as we begin to see it going wrong, don't wait till it gets wrong and crashes against the wall. Just when you start to see it turn, say, restore, restore. <laughs> Get back in line. We don't need to let everything crash and burn. If, if anyone should believe in restoration, it should be the redeemed. Right? All right. You ready to go to one other place here or two? Let's go to Jeremiah 33. You guys, your Bible's getting a workout today. Jeremiah 33. We like scriptures around this place. Jeremiah 33. Hmm. Wow. Jeremiah 33, 9 through 11. The Lord just spoke to me. There are some of us in this room that have some deep hurts. Very, very deep hurts. And we carry those hurts with us everywhere we go. And we've done a really good job of burying those, those hurts down real deep. So nobody knows. Got a good smile on our face, but we're hurting. You're going to be tempted... To, to not look at that area that really hurts and say restore because you're afraid that it might not happen. And you're hurting so bad in that area, you don't even want to touch it, you don't even want to look at it. But the Lord needs you to look at that area and say restore. Because if you do, that opens up the door for Him to get involved in that area. So even if you do it, Afraid, then do it afraid, but just start speaking restored to it. Don't keep that area closed off to the Lord. Let Him bring restoration. Can you receive that? Amen. Jeremiah 33, 9. It shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I shall do unto them. That's billboard advertisement. I'm going to do so good to you, the nations are going to find out about it. They shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. Thus saith the Lord, again there shall be heard in this place. <laughs> again there shall be heard in this place. Again there shall be heard in this place. You got it now? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. 
which ye, uh, which ye uh, say shall be desolate without man and without beast, even in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, that are desolate without man and without inhabitant, without beast. Excuse me, I've got to turn my page here. The voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for His mercy endureth forever. And of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, for I will cause to return the captivity of the land as at the first, saith the Lord. That's restoration. That's what that is. That's restoration. God has been so good to you and I that we are not to allow other people's drama to steal our joy. God has been too good and too faithful to you and I to let other people's drama make us have a bad day. Okay? You know that's what the devil wants. He wants their drama to affect you. For their trauma to become your drama. Man, when we let their trauma become our drama, we forgot all about how good God's been to us. I'm going to let that happen. How about you? Hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I have an announcement to make. You are not going to make things better in your life by being sad. So you're just not going to make things better by being sad. If the joy of the Lord is your strength, then, then sadness means you're weak. And if you're weak, you can't make your life better. So you just might as well get over being sad. My wife has this statement about putting on the happy pants. <laughs> right? You can put on grumpy pants, you can put on happy pants, might as well put on some happy pants. Right? Diseasement is the foundation for disease in your life. Diseasement is the foundation for disease showing up in your body. You're not going to make things better by being sad. Now, I'm going to make a strong statement here. Stop trying to help people that God won't even help. That's scriptural. That's scriptural, okay? Stop trying to help people that God won't even help. If you don't think that there's such a case, you need to read through the book of Proverbs because the Bible tells us people that God will not help and that there are types of people that God cannot help. And so why are we wasting our time trying to help people that God won't even help? That's lack of discernment. Don't be sad because of somebody else's drama. Wrong people will age you quickly. Wrong people will put some wrinkles on your face and they'll age you quickly. Why, why, why get saved and stay the same? <laughs> There's multitudes of people got saved, but they're still the same. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is greater than your unhappiness. Amen. It is. But we just get so emotional. <laughs> I just feel, I just feel, I just feel. I feel, I, I really feel. I just feel so deeply about it. Get over it. Grow up. Grow up. Mature people aren't touchy feely. Right? Mature people know how to live and not be guided and governed by their feelings. Because in five minutes, just put your watch in, in five minutes, you're going to change. So why should I pray for you? Because you really feel. Because in five minutes, you're singing a song. Why should I go into deep intercession for you when in five minutes you're going to feel differently? Amen. Why get saved and stay the same? All right, here's our last verse for today. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. <laughs> 
Acts chapter 3. I think this is our last scripture. You guys did good today. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. Acts 3, 19 through 21. You guys did real good. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. Amen. Come on, somebody say restore. 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 Isn't restore better than I just feel? Huh? Restore is, I mean, just the word has more solid feel to it than I just really feel. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Whom the whole heaven, pardon me, not whole heaven, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Okay, verse 21 again, I want you to catch the first part of that. Whom the heaven must receive until the times, plural, of restitution. Of all things. Now, I, I, I want to say something strong here. Restoration first, rapture second. Restoration first, rapture second. Jesus is in heaven and he is not coming back to rescue the church or to rapture the church until your restoration. Jesus is waiting on your restoration before He comes back. That's how important it is to Him that you be restored. Why is it taking so long? Why is He not coming back? He's waiting for you to be restored. I grew up Pentecostal, and they preached the rapture. In fact, one of my first sermons as a 12-year-old kid was rapture. Because I thought the rapture was going to happen before I got out of high school. And I was so mad because I wanted to get married and experience stuff. (laughs) All right? I just knew Jesus was going to come back before 1978. And I was struggling. Why did you call me to preach? I'm not even going to get married because you're coming back. So I had an opportunity to preach at that church that I was raised in when I was 30. And I told them, I said, Jesus is not coming back in 10 years. Oh, they did not like that because they're rapture-minded people. They are, man, they preach rapture every other weekend, okay? I said, listen to me, Jesus is not coming back for another 10 years. You could feel the walls go up. The old timers looked at me and... (laughs) 10 years later, I had an opportunity to go back to that same church. I said, do you remember 10 years ago when I was here? And I said, Jesus wasn't going to come back for 10 years. You all remember that? And I saw people nodding their heads. I said, guess what? He's not going to come back for another 10 years either. That was 10 years ago. (laughs) Why is he not coming back? Your restoration is important to him. So we need to get busy saying restore. Right? I I was going to give you the definition for the word restitution, but I'm not. I'll let you look it up. It just basically means to restore. (laughs) Right? Your restoration is at hand. God has not forgotten you. He loves you. Shame is no longer the issue. The issue is, will you believe your God to restore you? Right? You know what the first step to this is? The new birth. (laughs) People getting saved is the first step to their life being restored. Isn't that interesting? The very first step, Jesus, I give you my life. If we could just stay right there, how quickly he could restore us. I just give you my life. I just, my life is yours. <laughs> Sometimes the, the restoration process comes to a halt because, now, Lord, not that. Now, you know, I mean, I've been enjoying that since I was 17. Well, don't touch that one. <laughs> the first step of restoration is the new birth. God wants to restore you, my friend. 
He wants to restore you. Hallelujah. Every head bowed, please. Every eye closed. Father, I pray for the people in this place. I pray for those that will listen to this message. And I speak the word restoration over everybody. I speak restoration over every person in this room. Father, restore what the years have stolen. Restore what the devil has taken from them. Restore what's been damaged, what's been lost, what's been taken. Restore the health. Restore the peace. Restore the joy. Restore the finances. Restore the relationships. Restore, Father, I speak restore to your precious people. And I declare in the name of Jesus that this message is the beginning of your restoration. That your restoration is going to be speeded up because of this message today. Man, I don't go by feelings, but I got Holy Ghost goosebumps all over me when I said that. This message is the beginning of your restoration and it's speeded up in Jesus' name. Jesus wants to restore you quickly in every area. He wants to bring double and get rid of all shame. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Have your way. Restore. Restore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a good God. Thank you for loving us enough to restore. Forgive us for letting this word slip. Forgive us for not having this word in our mouth and in our heart. But we, we determined to do better, Lord. <laughs> We're getting this word back in our mouth. We're getting it in our heart. We're going to begin to see things through the light of restoration. And Father, forgive us for judging others that they're a waste. Forgive us for judging others that they're no good, that they're a throwaway. No one's a throwaway to you. Forgive us for judging people in situations and say, well, that's no good, that's trash, that's a throwaway. Not when the God of restoration gets a hold of it. So forgive us and cleanse us right now. And Father, we, we choose to be a person who wants to be used of you to restore others. Lord, don't just restore us, but use us to restore others. Father, we pray that this church will be a, a church that brings restoration to people's lives, to marriages to families, to finances. That we would never see someone and think they're too far gone, but that we would have the anointing to bring restoration to people. Let us be known as a church that has love and compassion, not judgment and criticalness, but a church that loves to see people restored. Let that be our chiefest delight, not money, not prosperity, though those things are good, but let our chiefest delight be to see people's lives restored for your glory and for their good. Father, as the pastor of this church, right now all of us receive the anointing to bring restoration into people's lives. We receive it, we receive the anointing to restore people's lives. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.